Last week, uh, as we have been for numerous weeks, we talked about David, King David of the Bible. And I talked about the road to compromise that he ended up taking. Um, the road to compromise versus the road to integrity. And he walked both of them. Uh, we're usually on either one or the other. It's tough to walk both of them at the same time. But David spent some time on the road to compromise. And it started when he stayed home during battle time. The kings were supposed to go out and fight with their men, as he had always done before. But um, he stayed home. Uh, and that's, he stayed home with the women, basically. And it was a wrong time for David to be home. He should have been on the field. Maybe he was feeling a little lonely or bored, maybe a little guilty that he should have been out there, but either way, he decided to go on his rooftop one evening. Um, I think he probably did it on purpose, probably hoping to watch uh, a beautiful woman bathe. And he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he had the wrong focus. He crossed boundaries, he committed wrong actions, and he sent for this Bathsheba to come and be with him, and he cheated with another man's wife and conceived a son. David didn't know what to do. He was as guilty as sin. And he tried to get her husband Uriah, one of David's 30 mighty men who went down in history and became legend. So he had Uriah come back from the battlefront to be with his wife. He was thinking, he goes and he gets with his wife for the night and uh, that indiscretion can get taken care of. So he decided to have him come and have dinner with him, with the king, and he did, and he got him drunk. But Uriah, even drunk, was a better man than David. And he went and he laid down at the beginning of the palace, at the doorway of the palace, and he said, who am I to go and be with my wife when I should be out fighting with the men? And he refused to go home. So David, knowing this indiscretion was still out there, he gave Uriah his own death sentence, sealed it, and said, take this to the commander-in-chief, and when he did, the commander looked and it said, put your eye in the front lines and withdraw from him. And David knew he would be killed, and that's exactly what happened. So David walked this road to compromise. He not only hurt himself, his family, Bathsheba, Uriah, but he ended up hurting the whole nation. And what does he do about it? He sits on it. For several months, he allows this indiscretion to fester inside of him. And he describes it in Psalm 32 and 38. You can read it on your own. And finally, the prophet, Nathan, shows up and basically says, David, I need to talk to you about something. I need to tell you something that happened in your kingdom. You see, David, there was this rich guy. There was this rich guy, and he has all kinds of sheep and lambs, and then he lives near this poor guy who only has this one ooh lamb, and, and this small lamb was his pet. He basically ate off his table, drank out of his bowl, slept in his arms. And the wealthy man had visitors coming to town, and he decided to cook a lamb for them. But instead of taking one of his own, he took the poor man's lamb. And he slaughtered it and he fed his guests. And it says in scripture that David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. David wants to know who the guy is. He wants to take his life. And David says he must pay for that land four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan points his finger at David and he says, David, you are that man. 
You are the one that took somebody else's wife. You destroyed that man's home. As a result, you destroyed his family. You are that man, David. In 2 Samuel 12, 13, David says to Nathan, after he's brought to justice, so to speak, says something very interesting. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. And David expresses what we would call genuine repentance here. He doesn't just verbalize his regret. He seems to be genuinely repentant. And he writes that for us in Psalm 51 as he thinks about what he did. Let me read to you a section from Psalm 51. You can read the rest of it on your own. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. And surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's interesting. He repeats that again at the end of this passage. He says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Many of us, we don't know what to do when we've blown it. We don't know, know what to do when we realize that we've been infected by sin. David was very aware of his sin. He realized he had done horrible things. Some of us, unfortunately, we live in a kind of self-righteousness. A kind of pride where we refuse to admit that we have issues. And personally, I think it stems from fear. We're afraid to admit that we're wrong. We're afraid to admit that we're sin, that we sin. Until we do something really <coughs> then we realize we're infected because our sin is staring us in the face. But God wants us to realize that we all all of us are infected by sin before those really terrible things even happen. And that's going to take a little bit of humility on our part to admit that. To admit that we've blown it. To admit that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And that's what the Bible tells us. So what do we do when we've blown it? Psalm 51 gives us an example of what God wants from us. And the psalm includes six things that God wants us to remember when we've blown it, when we've realized and come to that humble place of admitting that we've been infected on the inside. Number one, focus on God's love, not your mistakes. And it goes in line with what Tony was saying. First, God wants us to know that we can move past our mistakes. Ultimately, we need to look at the cross. Many of us, even as followers of Christ, we allow our mistakes to define us. Many of us, truth be told, we struggle to forgive ourselves. 
But God doesn't want us to be defined by our mistakes. He doesn't want you or I to be defined by our past. Ultimately, he wants you to be defined by his forgiveness. God wants you and I to be defined by the cross. In verse 1, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He recognizes God's unfailing love and compassion. And in light of that knowledge, he asks God to blot out his sins, to wipe them away, to remove them as far as the east is from the west. David knew that his heart was infected with sin. He knew that he needed God to work in his life. David knew who God was. So much don't. A lot of us struggle to move past our mistakes because we have a wrong image of who God is. Many of us we imagine he's kind of like one of these pagan gods who has lightning bolts and that he's waiting to zap us when we, st when we step out of line. And to be clear, God is a God of justice. And sin will be dealt with. But God is also a God of unfailing love and great compassion. You and I, ourselves, we have a love in our hearts that fails. Our love wears out. Our love runs dry. If you're married, you know that's true. We have to rely on God constantly to infuse in us an unfailing love, his unfailing love, so that we can share it with others. Because God's love never fails. It never runs dry. It never quits. It never stops. No matter what we've done. God doesn't stop loving us. The Bible from cover to cover is filled with that. And David writes in Psalm 23, he says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He got God. He knew who he was. It's the only reason he appeals to him. He knew that God hunts us down, and he follows us with goodness and love, not wrath or vengeance. God knows all about you, all about me. He prays that every week. You know all, God. You hear all. You see all. God knows every recess of our heart. God knows all the places that we keep hidden from everyone else. He knows all of our thoughts. He knows every action that we take. And yet still he has incredible compassion and love for us. It makes no sense. He still wants to extend to us forgiveness. He still wants to move us past our mistakes. The first thing is focus on God's love, not your mistakes. The second thing is confess your sins to God. Secondly, God wants us to admit our guilt. That's a hard one for a lot of us, isn't it? You know, once there was a man that cheated on his IRS forms for his taxes. And he felt overwhelming guilt as a result. He knew it. He knew he was wrong. So several months later, he wrote a note to the IRS. And the note said, I cheated on my forms. I put the wrong numbers down. I've been feeling guilty. I can't sleep at night. So I'm sending a check for $1,500. And then he added, if I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. 
God wants us to make a full confession. We can't settle for partially opening our heart to Him. We can't settle for partially confessing our sin. God wants us to come completely clean about our guilt. And that's what David does. He says, wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He couldn't stop thinking about what he had done. It wanted him. And David also said again, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. What about what he did to Bathsheba? And what about what he did to Uriah? What about the nation of Israel? His family? How, how can he say I sinned only against God? David isn't minimizing his sin against Bathsheba, Uriah, his nation, his family. Instead, he's highlighting his sin against God. David realized that he was busted, that he was broken, that he was infected. When he sinned, he realized that the person that he hurt the most was God. He hurt his relationship with God that had become so precious to him. And when you and I sin, the person we hurt the most is God. We don't stop to think like that, but that's the truth. In verse 5, David says, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. David is saying here that he was born with this infection of sin. That it's not something he learned to do. It's not something we learn to do. It's something we have. It is a part of us as long as we walk this earth. It's part of who we are. God wants us to come completely clean, to acknowledge our sinfulness. First John 1 John 1.8, it says that if we claim to be without sin, <coughs> we deceive ourselves, and the truth of God is not in us. We claim we're not infected by it, then we're somehow think we're above it or beyond it. We deceive ourselves. We refuse to admit that we're infected. And again, I, I, I think with a lot of us, that refusal comes from fear or pride, or maybe both. It's, it's amazing to me what happens when we get humble. It's like somebody with a broken arm. And you see this guy and his arm's over here and, and the other part of his arm's here and you say, dude, you got a broken arm. And then he looks down and he says, nah, it's just a scratch. No, you got a broken arm. He can ignore it all he wants, but his arm's broken. But some of us are like that. We, we don't admit that we're infected with this thing. So we don't admit that we blew it. We don't want to be weak. And coming to God humbly, for some of us, spells weakness. For coming completely clean makes us feel vulnerable. So focus on God's love, not your mistakes. Conf uh, confess your sins to God. Three, allow God to work in the midst of your brokenness. <coughs> Thirdly, God wants us to use our brokenness, brokenness to grow us. We never think about that side of it. In verse 6, David says, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. You cleanse me with hyssop. Hyssop is a plant 
that grows in the Middle East. It's kind of like a sponge-like plant that people would use uh, when they were offering sacrifices on the altar in Jerusalem. They would dip it to hyssop in blood, or if they were ritually cleaning something, they would dip the hyssop in water and sprinkle something clean. And David says he can't offer a sacrifice to remove his own guilt. He can't offer a sacrifice to remove his own guilt. There's nothing he could do. And he knew that. He realized that God had to work so that sin could be atoned for. And to be atoned means to be at one with God. And David knew that the sin that he had hindered his relationship with God, and there was nothing he could do to fix that. Not a thing. Period. He keeps coming out. He says, cleanse me. Cleanse me with this, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Now the word crushed there, it means broken, oppressed. He describes being crushed. This is what happens inside of us if we swallow guilt and don't come clean with it before God. It takes a toll on us on our emotional well-being, even our physical bodies, not to mention relationships. In Psalm 32 and 38, again, you can read that on your own, David describes what he felt before he, before he confessed his sin. In verses 3 and 4, he says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped, as in the heat of the summer. Before he came clean, he was emotionally a wreck. His energy was drained. He was depressed. He couldn't even get out of bed. He couldn't move. And to be clear, I'm not saying that all depression is a result of sin and guilt. But I am saying that guilt can lead to depression. Some depression is physiologically based. But we need to realize that some depression is spiritually based. Some depression is rooted in guilt and pride and fear and anger. But David did not only experience depression. Psalm 38, 4 and 38, 7, he says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester. They basically stink. And they're loathsome because of my sinful folly. I bowed down and brought and I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no help in my body. His depression was a result of a sin that he's not come clean with. And it's affecting his physical health. He was sick. It was destroying him from the inside out. Unconfessed sin will do stuff to us. It's going to hurt us emotionally. It's going to hurt us spiritually. It's going to hurt us physically. And that's what happened to David. And, and some of us carry around this pain and it takes a toll on us. But listen to what David said. He said, let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. He asks God to restore his joy. Now, let's be clear. Joy is not just the emotion of being happy. Joy is something that's from the inside. It's different from being happy. A guy named Carl Menninger, he's a non-Christian psychiatrist, and this is what he said, very, very interesting. If I could convince my patients that they were truly forgiven, 75% of them would never have to see me again. That's a non-Christian saying that people need forgiveness. And that's why Jesus came. That's why... What David needed 
That's what he cried out for. And, and that's what you and I, what we need. Some of us go through life beating ourselves up because we can't forgive ourselves, let alone receive forgiveness from someone else. Some of us are unable to forgive other people. And as a result, we hang on to it. We carry that grudge and it, it does stuff to us. We're unable to be cleansed by God. We're unable to be cleansed by God because we're not admitting to the sin that's there. It's like that guy with the broken arm. As long as he constantly reaffirms that his arm is not broken, is he going to the doctor? No. And so what happens is we continue to swim around in this sin cesspool. In the Middle East, shepherds, they would take sheep that were prone to run away and they would break their leg. It sounds cruel. And then they would bind up the leg, and they would put the sheep around their neck. And the shepherds would carry the sheep until the sheep's leg healed. And the sheep's head would usually rest right near the shepherd's arm. And sheep that are broken when they're lambs, they stay close to the shepherd when they're full grown. And it's the same for tr that's true for us. David isn't necessarily saying that God broke him. Circumstances, his choices, unforgiveness broke him. But God wants to give him, as well as us, joy in the midst of the brokenness. He wants to put you around his neck. He wants to hold you close. He wants your head to rest on his heart. And as you continue to grow, he wants you to stay close to his side. Scripture says that after this event, David never really sinned like that again. He didn't walk down that road of compromise again. And he continued on this road of integrity. Like the lamb that had been broken, he stayed close to the shepherd's feet. He didn't want to leave. The fourth thing is God wants us to leave behind our old ways. And there's a story of a man that walks into a restaurant. He orders a Coke. And as soon as he receives it, he throws it in the waiter's face. And the waiter, his fists are clenched, he's ready for a fight. And immediately the man says, oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And he actually was sorry. He says, I, I have this terrible compulsion. And I can't help it. When somebody hands me a, a drink, I, I just, I, I throw it in their face. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And, and then he said, he goes, I'm, I'm working really hard to overcome it. I'm in therapy. Would you bring me another Coke? The waiter's hands kind of open up. And he said to the man, he said, do you promise not to throw it in my face? And the man says, I'm going to do everything I can not to throw it in your face. I'm, I'm working really hard to resist the, this compulsion. And so the waiter says, okay, I'll bring you another. So the waiter comes back with another coat. The guy takes it, looks at it, throws it in the waiter's face. And the waiter says, as his sister points to again, I thought you said you wouldn't do that. And he says immediately, he says, this compulsion is so strong, I promise you that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check myself into a rehab center and get some help. Please forgive me, I'm so sorry. And the man felt genuine guilt and sorrow. So he checks himself into a rehab. And for one month, he gets this intense psychotherapy to deal with this compulsion. And then he gets out of the clinic. He goes back to the same restaurant. He walks up to the same waiter. And he says, with a sigh, I spent a month in rehab. I'm cured. They say, I'm cured. Can you give me a Coke? The waiter backs up and he goes, wait a minute. 
I had to change my shirt last time you were here. Are you sure you're here? And the guy says, no, I, I know I'm here. I know I'm here. I promise. And the waiter says, okay. You're saying you're here, and I'm going to believe that. I'm going to bring you a coat. And so the waiter brings him a coat, and the guy looks at it intently and throws it right in the waiter's face. And the waiter says, as he puts his hands up this time, he says, you just told me you were cured. You promised me you were cured. And the guy says, I am cured. I still have the compulsions, but I don't feel guilty about it anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that story. Oftentimes, we think the cure is to make ourselves not feel guilty about the sin. We look for the right counselor or the right friend who's going to tell us that what we're doing isn't wrong. We don't want to feel guilty. But that's not a cure. The cure is to be changed on the inside. Now David understood that. He said, hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. How is God going to do that? In verse 10, David says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your spirit from me. He's basically saying, God, I need newness. I don't want to go back to the same old infected behavior. I need you to cure this infection. I need you to create in me a pure heart. I just can't do it. I know only you can. I don't just want you to press the reset button and go back to the same infection. I want it to be totally removed. And so of us, that's what we need to ask for, just like David. We can ask for forgiveness, but unless we have that repentance, unless we say, God, create in me a pure heart. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's not going to take some effort on our part. We're going to be tempted to return to habits and unhealthy relationships and so on, but God wants to cleanse our hearts. He wants to create in us a pure heart. And David says, renew a steadfast spirit in me. He's asking God to make him loyal. Steadfast means loyal. Loyal sheep stay close to the shepherd. David asked God to use his brokenness to grow him, to draw close to him. He wants to leave his old, sinful, infected self behind. And he wants a new heart. God wants us to leave behind those old ways. Fifthly, allow, we need to allow God to help us deal with the consequences. The fifth thing we learn from this Psalm 51 is that we need to know and remember that we have blown it. God wants to help us through the consequences of our mistakes. 2 Samuel 12 describes the consequences of David's action. This is after Nathan confronts him. This is after David comes clean. And Nathan is letting David know the consequences. He said to David, what you have done privately will be done to you publicly by your own family members. And it does happen. David opened the door, and two of his sons walked through it. Little does he know that Absalom is going to try to kill him. And Solomon is going to follow in David's footsteps with 300 wives and 700 concubines. David knows there's going to be consequences for what he did. Now listen, isn't it interesting that David doesn't ask God to remove the consequences. A lot of us ask God to remove the consequences of our sin. <clears throat> you know, if I had a kid who didn't study, 
and then walked into the classroom to take the test and prayed, God, please forgive me for not studying, and please give me the knowledge I need to pass this test. And then they took the test, and they flunked. And then they came home, and they were ticked off at God because he didn't answer their prayer. If I knew about that, I'd have some pretty strong words for them. But some of us expect that. Listen, God may remove the consequences for not studying. But he may not. But God does say that he will help us through dealing with those circumstances. And David knows that. So in verse 12, David prays, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me, to allow me to go the course. David knows that he's going to have to deal with the consequences, but he asks God to maintain his joy in the midst of them. He asked God to sustain him because he knows it's going to be a rough journey. He knows he's going to have some difficult years. And so he asked God to give him a willingness to persevere. And God wants to do that for all of us because we've all made mistakes. And with those mistakes do come some consequences. Are we forgiven? Absolutely. Are we loved? Absolutely. But God wants to walk with you and I as we deal with those consequences. He is not going to let us drift into despair. He wants to give us back our joy. And not only that, he wants to give us a willingness in our spirit to persevere and not quit when it gets rough. And that's what David knows and understands and is praying for. The last thing is allow God to use your mistakes for ministry. The sixth thing we need to remember is that God wants to turn our mistakes into ministry opportunities. In verse, thing, uh, verse 13, David says, after he talks about branding, give me a willing spirit to sustain me and give me a new heart, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. He is saying that he will have something to pass on to other people. Do you realize that the mistakes you and I have made, the brokenness that maybe we've experienced, can be the foundation of God's work in our life? God can actually take that and turn it around for ministry. God can use our failures and our broken times to help others. Isn't that amazing? The best teachers aren't necessarily those that have read everything in the books who have an incredible head knowledge. The best teachers are those who have lived life. Oftentimes, they've had to learn it the hard way. And when they speak, it's through experience. David asked God to take what he learned the hard way and use it in him and God to use it to teach others about who he is. He wants to use his experience to help others not fall down the same road to compromise that he did. Have you ever wondered, I don't know how many of your golfers here or you know about golfing, but have you ever wondered why golf, golf balls have, have indentations all around them? They're not perfectly round, right? They have these little indentations all around them. Golf balls are not perfectly round. That seems kind of crazy and odd, right? They have these impurities, these indentations, these flaws, but they are intentional. They, they have these indentations because aeronautical engineers tells us that a perfectly round golf ball without impurities, without indentations, will fly about 130 yards tops. However, if that golf ball has indentations, if it has flaws in a sense, 
it will utilize the wind resistance and fly twice as far as a regular round ball. There's a spiritual truth in that. God can and wants to use our flaws, our brokenness, our indentations to make us fly hard, uh, higher, to make us go farther. The places where we've been broken the most may be the very places where you and I will be most effective in helping other people. God wants to use our flaws and mistakes for something good, if we're willing to come clean with him and give him those mistakes. So, are you in the place where you need to come clean with God? To receive forgiveness? Do you need to confess things to him? Do you need to step away from pride and fear and say, okay, God, this is me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know about it anyway. Let me just let you know that I'm admitting it. God tells us to come to him because, why? Because he's already paid the price. Ephesians 1 7 says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's already paid the price, past, present, and future sins. They're done, they're paid for. Why do we need to come and confess to Him? It's not for His benefit, that's for ours. That's for ours. Because we're coming clean with our God. We're admitting who we are and who we are. And we're saying, God, I got nowhere to go for you. And why can we go there? Because he has a ticket that said paid in full and it's got our name on it. How cool is that? This is our God. And he's calling us to bigger and better things than we can ever dream of. But he just needs us to get on the way. As our gentlemen come and we distribute the elements, let's think about where we are in the scope of things with them. What road we're on.